car get golf? Maybe, maybe, maybe I shot golf. Huh? Cool. Maybe I killed somebody. Now, there's a lot of translation. Just when I say, hey, I got shot, may, maybe, what that re- maybe what I was really saying was this. Hey, I really like this girl. So today, I went and bought her a dozen roses. I got a shot. Right? But here, here you just called me a murderer. <laughs> okay? So, so you need to have six. Uh, I'm going to give you six questions because we do that with Scripture. We'll go into it and we'll read it and you'll think, well, God's saying this. And he's like, you just called me a murderer and I'm telling you that I love you. Okay, that's kind of what's going on. So the first one you can put there now, Andrew. Who wrote it? That makes a big deal. When Paul writes something, Paul is known for being very blunt. Paul's kind of like Monica. All right? In a good way. I like Paul. He's probably one of my favorite authors. I don't, I don't, like, guy, I don't like guys who <laughs> butter it up. I just don't. Yes. Blunt. Yeah, you're kind of blunt sometimes. It's good though. I'm blunt. Sometimes. Or that kid right here. Or let's see. When when I go to James, when you go to the book of James, James was the brother of Jesus. He was Jewish. James always followed the rules. So when I read the book of James, I'm gonna look at him as kind of how goody tissue. You, yeah. I mean, we don't want to say that in a negative sense, but James is a. I mean, but he's a rule follower. He's a rule follower. So when you see verses that say faith without works is dead, that's something to look for. I mean, is it true? Yes. But can you understand what would come from Paul? Now, would you necessarily see um, Paul saying that? No. No. Because he he would say, no, 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 it's by grace. All right? By faith through grace you've been saved. No one, not the gift of works, lest any man should boast. Paul would actually say, no, it's no works. And James would say, but if you don't have works, you're, you're not saved. And the thing is, both of those passages are true. You just got to take into account who wrote them, okay? Next. Next question. Who received it? That's a big deal. The people at Corinth. Because I know y'all are familiar with that. Describe these people to me. Terrible. They're sinners. Aren't we just terrible in some sense? What else? Were they very spiritually long in their walk? No. No. Is is, Is Nick here? Yes. Okay. Cool. Sorry, that was random. Um, but so, so when you read, when you step into the book of Corinth and, you, and you're saying, okay, who's reading it? The people who are reading this are people who are far from God. So when you're reading it, you need to realize this text is intended for people who are far from God. But now when you go to Philippians, I love Philippians. Paul, man, he had a big heart for Philippians because they were just doing the work of God so good. All right? You, when you walk into that book, you're like, no, nah, man, this is a little bit more calm. Okay? It's going, to ch- it's going to affect the way you, you, you read it. Next one. What sources did they use? What do I mean by that? They draw their experiences. Yeah. What, what sources did they use? Um, go to Luke. Chapter 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Why do you get it? Just start reading it, and I'll tell you when to stop. And everybody just start what? listening. Chapter 1. Start from the beginning and just start reading it. Just read? Okay. And as much as many have undertaken to confine there to a thing that had been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word had delivered it then to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time passed to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, Theophilus. Yep. may you have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Keep going. Keep going. In the days of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named... All right, you stop there. Cool. All right, sorry. Luke wrote the book of Luke. He said that the way he wrote Luke is he did what? Was he there? Mm-hmm. Yep. Mr. Kyle got it. What happened? He went and interviewed eyewitnesses. So when you hear him talking about Mary, hearing from the angel, she's going to have a child, who did Luke probably go and speak with? Mary. Mary. You have to consider their sources. How did they get their information? Okay? Because that, that, that it changes a lot. Matthew, was Matthew with Jesus a lot? Yes, he was one of the apostles. He was, he was right there on the scene, okay? So, the sources are important. 
All right, next. What style did they use? All right, Paul, man, he likes to be rhetorical a lot. Sometimes he'll even be semi-sarcastic. James will be, he'll just be like super serious. Okay, as long with Peter. Peter will be super serious. Uh, the author of Hebrews, he likes to be very historical. He's like, let me tell you how this interacts with Jew Judaism. All right, next. Six approaches. Um, when was it written? Does that make a, does that make a difference? Yes. Yes. How many times have people gone to the Old Testament and say, hey, this applies to you now. You have to do it just the same way now as you did it in the Old Testament. When was it written? In the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, before who came and died on the cross? Jesus. Jesus. And Jesus came and he fulfilled the Old Testament, right? So does that interpret how we read the Old Testament? Yes. So in the Old Testament, when it says you shouldn't get tattoos, all right? Does that necessarily mean you can't get tattoos now? No. No. And the reason we know is because uh, we can go back to the culture and realize that tattoos were actually a pagan ritual. And it has to go back to doing looking like the prostitute thing. You don't want to look like the world. And But now that we're in the New Testament, you have to consider when it was written. Okay? That, that, that changes your interpretation. All right, next. All right, why was it written? Why was it written? Why was the book of 1 Corinthians written? To, to, the course, to, straighten them out. to straighten them out. Why was the book of Philippians written? To praise them. To praise them. There are also other books in the Bible that were written because people were going through hard times. Remember in James, we talked about how there he says, Consider it a joy when you suffer. So we know why is that, what is one of the reasons that book's being written? You're suffering through, that through, yeah, these people are going through some hard times. So when you're reading the Bible and you're like, man, I'm going through a hard spot, it might be a good book to turn to, right? So these are, these are six questions that, that will help us point on the right way. Okay? They will help us point on the right way. Um, so what, when, it, when I say why was the book written, we need to say also not only in the sense of what people, but write this down. What is God revealing about himself? What is God revealing about himself? God's, by, God's word to us is his word to us. He is trying to reveal something about himself to us. Anytime you text somebody, ultimately you're trying to reveal something about you to them. It might be the answer to a question. It might be the desire to go to the movies at night. But no one texts, hopefully, a text that just says, Hi, my name is Monica. And I'm 15, right? No one does that, right? When, when you send a message to somebody, you're trying to communicate a point. God's word is his message to mankind. So when you're reading it, and you read in there, oh, you shouldn't get tattoos. What's he trying to convey right here? He is trying to say something. Don't get tattoos. You don't want to look like the world. Maybe. And that's where we have to go look at the context. But but what God's trying to say something. All right. The next thing that's going to come up on the slide is huge. We're almost done. This is one of the biggest things. This is called the key hermeneutical principle. Somebody read it. The Bible cannot mean something that it did not mean in its original author, original All right. This is, as we move forward in this class and y'all start learning how to do exegesis today, we just talked about how to go to the text and open it up and read it. When it comes to you interpreting it, it cannot mean something today that it didn't mean back then. It just can't. All right? I know y'all already know this because we've done some exegetical work on it. Jeremiah 29 11 was written to people where? Exile. People who have been dealing with exile. So it was written to specific people in a specific times for a specific uh, situation, which was telling them what? You people in exile, I've got a what for you? Plan. Plan. I've got a plan for you. Can we take that and say it means something different to Americans today? No. 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 It never works that way. We need to make sure. Now, I will tell you, did God bring the people back from exile? Yes. yes. Did he keep his promise in Jeremiah 20, 11? Yes. 
So is there a point there for us? Yes. What's one of those points? God keeps his promises. Keep promises. And there, there's a few others, but but do you see the birth is still there is still something for us in it. Okay? But uh, it's it's to us, it's not about us. It's about God. Okay? So this is important as we go forward, especially when we're doing emotions. We need to make sure that when we're pulling points and stuff, that the points aren't just stuff we're making up. It's stuff that the Bible is really saying, right? I could make a point about anything in the Bible. I could probably use scripture to make a point that one day unicorns will come riding on the backs of Pokemon and then they will evolve into Power Rangers and kill Tyrannosaurus Rexes that have come back from the grave. I could probably make that point it's using cool scripture out of context. That's pretty okay. awesome, right? But it just doesn't work that way because the Bible cannot what? Mean something today. Yo, that will take you far. Anybody you ever debate with who is anti-Jesus, they're going to try to make the Bible mean something today different than what it meant back then. That's one of their places they start, especially as we get into uh, more philosophical stuff, um, learning how to debate. You're going to need to know. That's a lot of times where they start. Okay. So, do I have the next song here, bud? Yep. All right. Let's do it. We're on the home stretch. Five basic principles of hermeneutics. Now, we said hermeneutics is two parts. The first part is what? Is biblical what? Exegesis. exegesis. What's exegesis, you guys? Going in and learning what exegesis means. Going in, learning what it means in what? Context. 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 The second part of hermeneutics is con contextualization. contextualization, which means what? How does it what? Apply. 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 So the first part, what does it? And then how does it apply. apply? This makes up herma nudis. Okay, so five basic areas of learning what something means and how it applies. There's five. The first one is the grammar, literary. Okay, what I mean here, you don't have to write all this down because we're going to get into this as we start doing exegetical work. Genre, we said that. Is it history? Is it law? Is it wisdom? Is it sermons? Is it gospels? Is it the letters, songs, poetry? You with me? That changes the way you read it. If I'm reading a song that's talking about a woman net being a tower, am I really going to think that there was some chick out there with a tower net? No. Now, if I was reading history and it says, hey, there's a net lady with a tower neck, then I have to believe what? There's a tower neck. There's a tower neck lady. <laughs> All right? So, so that makes a big deal. All right. It's grammar. Um, lexicon, meaning what do the words mean? That's literary. The second part is historical cultural. Did I have that one there? Yep, historical culture. Okay? When you're learning what it is in its original context, context you need to know what's going on politically. Who's in charge? Is Herod in charge right now? Or is Pharaoh in charge right now? All right? Is it Greek culture? Is it Egyptian culture? They have a whole different set of beliefs. Historical. What's going on in history right now? Are we talking about ancient Near East? Are we talking about Greek or Roman times? Religious. What's the major culture? Do they believe in Ra, which is what the Egyptians believe in, or do they believe in Zeus? Okay. Social issues. What's going on here? You know, in the Old Testament, uh, women were treated a lot different than they were starting to be treated in the Testament in customs. Okay. So your historical context. Next thing is your contextual. Now, right down beside this, most. Errors occur here. When it comes to reading the Bible in what? Context. Context. I'll say this. You know how when you die, there's there'd be a couple things you wish you were known for thinking? Yeah. Is that any ever thought about that? Like, like when I die, I wish people knew I was a nice guy. You know, you know what I'm saying? That kind of stuff? When I die, this is one of the things. I wish people would know. If you can't understand the Bible, you don't need to go buy a dumber Bible. You just need to get better at doing context studies. You don't need to go buy a dumber Bible that makes it easy. You just need to learn how to read in context. Which means what came right before the passage, what's after the passage, what's going on in the book. If you know that, do you need a dumb Bible? No. You don't. All right? Where is it in the canon? When I say canon, we'll get into this next week. In the whole Bible. New Testament, Old Testament. All right? When you don't do it, it's called proof texting. Now, you're going to hear that word a lot if you continue, especially in church life. Proof texting is where you take a verse and you make it say what you want to say. All right? Theological. All right, you got some issues going on here. The Bible is a book about who? There you go. Remember that. 
The Bible is a book about God. If the Bible is a gun, the crosshairs would be on who? Jesus. Yes, would be on God. All right? He is the center. The center of the message of the Bible is clear. It's about Jesus. What is the best interpretation of Scripture? Bible. There you right. go. Scripture. Scripture is the best interpretation of Scripture. If you don't understand it, you can probably go somewhere else and do it. All right? God's revelation in the Bible, as you see, is progressive. In, in the Old Testament, they said, Hero, hero, our God is one. All right? And then that is true. But at the same time, in the New Testament, we come to realize he's one, but he's also what? Two he's others. three in he's one. Oh, my goodness. But it's, it's, it's what's going on there, theological. And the lastly, practical. Practical. There's needs going on today, right? Like we're about to go down there and have youth group. We're going to have students showing up here who they love Jesus. We're going to have students showing up here because they love the, the girl they're sitting beside. Okay? But that Bible is appropriate for everybody. And if we're going to do hermeneutics and we're going to study it in the right context and we're going to learn how to apply it, we have to make sure that we're being practical. So when I go down there tonight, do I need to preach the entire youth sermon as if I'm speaking to my BSM 201 students no. who understand? No. no. I need to speak some stuff that, that, that y'all are with, but I also need to speak some stuff that's practical for kids who, who, who aren't close to Jesus. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like tonight, one of the points is you're never too far away from God to come close to God. All right? Who is that, who's that kind of for? Everybody. It's for everybody. It's good for non-believers, but in your life, it's good for you the way you think about your non-believing friends. Okay? Um, so that's, I think that's all I got, right, Andrew? Yep. All right, so, so let's just let's do a little recap, and then uh, Andrew's going to come up and share with you your homework for next week. All right, today, as far as Bible's going, we just talked about how do you step into the Word. You need to do it the right way. One time I was going into a pool, into the shallow end. No, it was the deep end. And you know the little metal ladders? Oh, yeah. They go down to the side of the pool. I don't know why I didn't want to jump in.